And we are back once again. It's the Horror Guys with episode 181. I'm Brian. And I'm Kevin. And as always, we've got four horror movies and a short film for you. And we're going to talk about them some. That's what we do, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's our job. What do we got? That's why we're here. We got the Rob Zombie Halloween 2 from 2009, his second take on that. And we got Bloody Hell, which is a brand new one. And Moloch, also very new. And a uh, vampire movie, interesting one, from uh, 1973, Ganja, Ganja and Hass. Sounds very 70s. Oh, oh, this couldn't be any more 70s. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's what we're going to be talking about in this episode. And, and we got a short there, too. And we got a short also. And if you go over to HorrorBulletin.com and sign up for our weekly newsletter, you'll also get to read about 1944's The Soul of a Monster. And... Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell from 74. I remember that one. I saw it when it came out. I, yes. saw, it, I saw it at the drive-in. I remember that one. Caveman looks a lot or he, he looks a lot out. more like a caveman than he does Boris Karloff. Mhm. Yeah. Big hairy guy, hunchback looking. That weird one. version. Weird take on Frankenstein. That one creeped me out when I was a wee lad. It creeped me out last week. <laughs> And, of course, if you like to read our reviews, go over to HorrorGuys.com and check out all the stuff on the podcast is there to read. And if you want to pick up everything, including the stuff that shows up in the podcast and the stuff that shows up in the newsletter and any extra stuff we might have, check out the Horror Bulletin Monthly Magazine. The 11th issue got put on this morning. Nice. So that should be out there available for you. Paperbacks from Amazon or ebooks from pretty much anywhere you get the ebook place from. Wherever fine ebooks are sold. Yeah. All the ebooks, fine or otherwise. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to start off with Halloween 2. Rob Zombie's 2009 take on Halloween 2. Yeah, this isn't the 1979, 1980 one. 1981. 81, okay. Yeah, what's the second? Yeah. yeah, this is the new Halloween 2, directed and written by Rob Zombie, stars Scout Taylor Compton. Tyler Maine, Malcolm McDowell, and Sherry Moon Zombie. Hour and 45 minutes. Spoiler free? What happened spoiler free? Well, this one kind of goes off the rails with too many characters going in too many directions. We aren't supposed to root for Michael to kill people. And that's kind of where this one goes at the halfway point. Please die. Yeah. Please die. And there's actually a long stretch that wakes you wondering, where is Michael? Didn't he used to be in this movie? Yeah. Um, overall, we didn't enjoy this one very much. No, it was pretty awful. Yeah. We... I'm not going to say it's the worst of the entire series. No. But it's pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, we didn't enjoy it. Not Rob, Rob Zombie's best work. We liked no. his, his first one better. Uh, but It wasn't great, but it was better than this. Yeah. All right. Well, oh, hey, speaking of which, the, yeah. the, the Munsters. Rob Zombie's coming up with that the Munsters looks pretty soon. awesome, the preview for that. I so want to see that. I had my doubts about it, and then I saw the trailer, and I really like the way it looks. Yeah, so do I. And yet, everyone I see that sees the trailer says, oh my God, this is crap. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. We're going to be contrarians <laughs> on this one. It looks pretty good from the trailer, I thought. But I, I keep, you know, I, I run into people online, too, that loved this movie, this Halloween 2. Thought this was the best Rob Zombie of all his movies. Horror fans are really? just weird. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. That makes us like the uh, podcasters of the weird people. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, this time, Halloween 2 synopses and spoilery summary. We start off with Deborah Myers, who died in the previous film, visiting young Michael in the asylum. Different actor. Yeah, different actor because the little kid has gotten, it's been a couple years. Yeah. He talks about a white horse and credits roll. And somewhere in there, we get some text on the screen this, that explains the metaphorical significance of a white horse. Mm -hmm. I didn't write it down. It didn't seem important at the time. But they and use the white horse a lot. The white horse shows up a lot, and I'm mm -hmm. still not sure that it's actually relevant of anything. <laughs> it, it's just dumb. Well, I think he was trying to bring back some of the magic and the connection, the psychic connection between the two of them a little more in this, and a little more of the supernatural, more so, I thought, than the first his first take on Halloween. But I, yeah, it still didn't work for me. No. no. 15 years later, immediately after the events of the previous film, the 2007 version that is, Sheriff Brackett stops Laurie and takes away her gun. She says, I killed him! They carry various survivors out of the Myers house, including Annie and Dr. Loomis. Laurie then goes into surgery, 
and the medics throw Michael's body into the back of an ambulance, but they run into a cow on the road. That's a nicely placed cow. Mm Mm-hmm, and a solid cow. (laughs) (laughs) It does some damage. Well, the driver is killed, but the other medic watches Michael climb out of the back of the van and then kills him. Michael sees his mother and a white horse in a vision. This is a vision that he keeps having of himself as a boy, alongside his mother and a white horse, and we see this over and over, and it quickly gets tiresome. But Rob Zombie needed some way to get his wife back into the movie, so, you know, his dead mother is, hey, she's back. I noticed that's a common thread in Rob Zombie's movie. No. His, his wife is in his movies. His wife is in his <laughs> movies? Really? <laughs> but at least she's competent and good. I mean, this this was all around a stinker movie. But Some people know. really absolutely hate her. And oh, I, I think, I think, I she's, think fine. she's always been yeah. fine. Yeah, yeah. Right. And she's uh, the mom in, uh, in uh, the upcoming Munsters movie. Yep, yep. Yeah. Lily Munster, yeah. which I think is one of the reasons people hate it. Well, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I've, I've always enjoyed her work. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, well, whatever. Yeah. yeah. We'll see when it comes out. Yeah. Lori wakes up in the hospital and staggers to Annie's room. We see that she has the worst nurses ever. Suddenly... The nurse keels over dead, and Michael is standing there. There's a protracted chase, and Laurie soon soon winds up limping through the rain outside, but everywhere she goes, there are dead people. Michael has been at work. The night watchman comes to his office and finds Laurie hiding under his desk. He locks her inside to go get his car. Buddy the watchman doesn't live long after that, but Michael breaks in and then kills Laurie. Uh, Oh, wait a minute, this was all just a dream. All the hospital stuff was just a dream. So you're set up thinking <clears throat> that it's going to be just like the first two original movies. Were in the hospital in part two. But and no. in fact, it's not. It's two years later, and these nightmares seem to be a regular thing. She now lives with Annie and Sheriff Brackett. Lori resents seeing her therapist, but Annie's not too sympathetic about it. It's been two years tonight, and she shot Michael in the head, so clearly it's all over. And then at her therapist's office, we see a Rorschach painting on the wall that clearly has two white horses on it. Sure, there that's what you saw. was two white horses, wasn't that's it? That's what you saw. I saw Man's Inhumanity to Man. It looked like white horses <laughs> looked, to me. Okay, yes. <laughs> I know which I'd bet on. It was on. <laughs> two big, obvious white horses, yes. <laughs> well, Dr. Loomis is back in town. He's a big celebrity <clears throat> prima donna now, giving a lecture on, you guessed it, Michael Myers. Milking that out. Yeah, making, Even, a, making a living off oh, that. Oh, big time. He's yeah. Dr. Phil level. Yeah. Even though they never found the body, he angrily swears that Michael is dead. <clears throat> Michael is not dead. He's just been following visions of his mother out in the woods. Some rednecks in a truck spot him on the road and try to beat him up for trespassing or something, and that goes badly. It does, yeah. Yeah, whenever you see rednecks in a truck, just hide. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, unless you're Michael Myers, then just go ahead and stand there. <laughs> <laughs> Lori goes to work, and her friends want to go to the costume party tonight. Sheriff Brackett gives a speech about Lee Marvin, the great actor Lee Marvin. Who? But Annie and Lori have no idea who that is. <laughs> this isn't 1978 anymore. As Michael eats the bodies of his recent... He was eating, wasn't he? I believe he was. Yeah. Well, as Michael eats the bodies of his victims, Lori starts vomiting. We soon see that Michael has very weird visions and dreams. Loomis argues with his assistant, Mrs. McDonald, about the location shoot in front of the old Myers house. She thinks it's going to stir up trouble. Laurie dreams about killing Annie and seeing her mother. She's screaming and panicky at the psychiatrist's office, and Laurie is just a mess. Annie doesn't approve. Yeah, so it's kind of like they're having each other's dreams and each other's visions a little bit. They're linked. They are definitely linked. Yeah. Over at the strip club, Howard gets told to take out the trash. And we've never seen any of these people before. We just suddenly decide to go to a strip club. Random victims. He runs into Michael's outside and threatens him. That goes badly. Michael then goes inside and beats the owner and a dancer to death. You know, most of these people in these Halloween movies kind of have it coming. You know, teenagers having sex and all. These were just people hanging out, doing their jobs. Yeah, yeah. In the struggle, the dancer pulls off part of Michael's mask, and you can kind of see his eye and his cheek there, which Uh is kind of new. New thing. Michael arrives in town and sees a billboard advertising Dr. Loomis's new book. Loomis is having a huge book signing with people lined all the way around the block. Linda's father comes to confront him for killing his daughter. Loomis, not Michael. The man pulls a gun, which is a little excessive. 
Ms. McDonald warns Loomis that there will be serious repercussions for messing with people's lives. And really, I mean, he, he's a jerk for going on for years with this thing, but mm-hmm. it's just a it wasn't true, his true crime fault, book. Or, yeah, it wasn't his fault. He tried. I mean, he did the best yeah. he could. He, he, he's clearly a jerk, but he didn't do anything wrong. No, no. Uh-uh. Lori freaks out and <clears throat> runs out of the house. The sheriff sends a deputy over to the house to guard Annie, just like last year. So the sheriff's been sending people to the house every Halloween. He, mm-hmm. he, he knows things aren't as calm as they pretend. Yeah, he's not convinced. No. Lori finds out in Loomis's book that her real name is Angel Myers, Michael's sister. She didn't know this until the new book came out. Loomis, meanwhile, appears on a late-night talk show with Weird Al Yankovic, and Loomis hates it, but his assistant still says it was great publicity. A bunch of boring stuff happens at a Halloween party. There are a bunch of people we don't know about or care about that are suddenly introduced. Yeah, okay, whatever. Then where's Michael? I don't know. This might have been about the point where I was saying, isn't Michael supposed to be in this? 20 minutes of It seemed like a long stretch. Party crap. Yeah, yeah. Too, too long of a stretch there. Finally, <laughs> finally, Michael shows up at the party to kill people. And by this time, we're okay with that. <laughs> we see that Lori has come to the party, and she now sees Deborah and young Michael in a vision also. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Michael, who is just at a party in town, suddenly appears at the sheriff's isolated farmhouse way out in the country. Moving at the speed of plot. Yeah, teleporting Michael or something. Mm, It's crazy. Bad editing might be more like it. (laughs) Well, he kills the deputy and Annie. Mm. Lori and Maya come home and don't see the deputy's body outside. They do, however, find Annie inside, torn to pieces, but still slightly alive. Maya calls 911, and then Michael gets her. The sheriff arrives home and finds Annie's body, and he takes it badly. Old Michael, young Michael, and Deborah carry Lori away and hide in a barn. Someone, somewhere, sees this and reports it to the police department. They all surround the place with helicopters and police, and Loomis hears about this on the news and rushes right out there. It's a chance to revive his career. Loomis goes into the barn and confronts Michael. Lori screams that the ghosts are holding her down, but Loomis doesn't see anything. Then Michael yells, die, and what? kills Loomis before every cop in the state shoots him. What? Michael spoke? He spoke. He spoke. He said, he die. Speaks. Well, he spoke a lot as a child, which was kind of yeah, annoying in, in, the, in the previous in the first film. One. Yeah. Here, he's speaking as an adult. Huh. First time. First time ever. Well... Yeah, one thing you mentioned when it was over, every time he'd stab people, you'd hear him grunting. Grunting, yeah. <laughs> and I thought that took away from it. It took away from the... It makes it an effort. He should be effortlessly killing. Effortlessly killing, killing yes. I thought that made it creepier, the silence. Yeah. Yeah. And then Lori walks out and picks up Michael's knife, and all the cops suddenly open fire on her, too. Sad music plays because everybody's dead. Yeah. Yeah. The end. All right, well, um, what year does this take place? We don't know. It's a little vague. We never see any cell phones, and the TV shows all show old black and white movies. The cars are all fairly old, and yet I notice flat screen monitors at the hospital. Mm -hmm. So it's a little vague. I suspect it was still supposed to be 1978, and they got a little sloppy. Mm -hmm. But we don't know this. And you mentioned the Knights in White Satin song repeating over and over. That was was during her dream. dream. We didn't realize at the time, yeah. Yeah, it's a, how every, long is this song? Every place she goes, yeah, the TV is playing, you know, in the hospital, that, that whole thing, in the guard, guard yeah. house, and yeah. Well, we see Michael without his mask several times. Although it's usually pretty dark, it's more than we've seen before. On the other hand, he's not wearing his green jumpsuit anymore. He, his mask is all beat up. His hair has gotten really long. He looks more like a cross between The Undertaker and Sasquatch in this film. He's been living in the woods without any hygiene, so... I mean, it's realistic, but Mm. it's not what we want. (laughs) The vision seemed pretty pointless, other than giving Sherry Moon Zombie a reason to return in the film and some unnecessary motivation for Michael. Adding Deborah's ghost to this was just a horribly bad idea, but it was trying to bring back the supernatural element that was definitely missing in the previous film. By the 55-minute point, I was rooting for Michael just to kill everyone and move on, Laurie and Loomis included. Lori was fine in the first film, but an irrational, drugged-up, hysterical lunatic throughout almost all of this film. Not sympathetic at all. 
There are too many characters, especially at that party, and pretty much everyone except the sheriff and Annie deserved a quick death. And the deputy. He was just he did job. Yeah, he was just yeah. there. But the sheriff actually seems like a likable character, and Annie mm-hmm. did nothing wrong either. Yeah. There's just way too much hysterical screaming and crying. It got annoying quick. I can't express enough how badly I wanted this to be over halfway through. <laughs> we were supposed to be rooting for Lori, but the problem was we weren't. Bad. 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 Not good. Yeah, more. not good, yes. Yes, our least favorite of the week, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Our runner-up for least favorite of the week, <clears throat> Gunja and Hess from 1973. Written and directed by Bill Gunn, uh, also directed by Lawrence Jordan, stars Dwayne Jones from the uh, Nightmare... No, not the Nightmare Before uh. Christmas, would it? <laughs> Night of the Living Dead. Night of the Living Dead guy. That other yeah. night movie, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Marlene Clark and Bill Gunn, hour and 50 minutes. It's a, There's a trailer on YouTube if you've never heard of it. See, at least I found this one interesting. And... You know, didn't didn't actively hate it. I'd give it an above a five for sure. Mm. The the Halloween I'd give below a five. Yeah, okay, maybe. <clears throat> this one tried to be unique at least. Yeah, yeah. Well, spoiler free, it's an interesting film of the time, but it's very slow. It's dated, but not in an interesting way. There's a strong cast and unique director choices, but overall, we did not find it very entertaining. Overall, no. But I'd give it a six because it's interesting. I and, really, and the cast. I, I was impressed with the, the cast. I, I liked the, 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 uh, the two actors playing Gan, Gan, Ganja and Hess. And, uh, I like how you, know, you pronounce your name different every time. Yeah, I can't <laughs> say Ganja. Ganja, it's hard to say. <laughs> yeah, I was not impressed with the acting. Okay. I was definitely not impressed with the directing. Hmm. Oh, I, well, I'm going to give it maybe hmm. a low four. Oh, I really... Okay. I did not enjoy this much. For as much hype as it gets and love as it gets. Halloween 2 was a big budget, big director, big... They spent a lot of money on it, and it was just awful. I'd give that a solid three, I think. Yeah, it was was very... It was interfered with by the studio, and even Rob Zombie hated it. Mm -hmm. This one was clearly very low budget, labor of love, sort of a black exploitation thing. Mm -hmm. But... And it is very highly regarded historically, but I did not like it. But you did more. Okay. I I liked it more than you. Spoil it for us. What happens? Okay. We are told that Dr. Hess Green, an anthropologist, was stabbed by a stranger three times. The dagger was infected, and he could not be killed. Credits roll. And this is told by a, uh, a the, dialogue on the, the, the reverend, the preacher. Well, no, this is a thing that pops up on the Oh, screen, the text on screen, the, yes. Before the credits, yeah. Okay, so Telling we, us what we hear that Hess has been stabbed by a stranger with a dagger three times. And it made him an immortal vampire, vampire yes. card kind of person. Yeah. This is on screen text yes. as credits roll. Then what? And then we begin in a church. Uh, <laughs> reverend Luther Williams. Boy, he's a he was a hoot. <laughs> <laughs> and I wonder if he just they're, they're twenty four hours a day narrating, you know. And <laughs> I mean, I mean preaching, but, but anyway, really into his preaching. Anyway, Reverend Luther Williams narrates that he likes his job and his people like him, and he also works as a part time chauffeur for Doctor Hess Green. He explains that Hess is an addict, but he's not a criminal. He is a victim addicted to blood. Okay, so now we've been we've read that he's a vampire. We've and, heard that he's a vampire. But this is weird because he's not a vampire. He's not a vampire yet apparently. We're about to see what we've already been told twice. Yeah. Well, Jack Sargent welcomes Dr. Green into the building. George Meta will be his new assistant. Green and Meta talk over dinner and they talk about hunger. Soon we get a dreamy sequence that, uh, that includes Sergeant and Maida wearing silver masks and a bunch of tribal people walking, walking in Africa. Okay, this character, Jack Sergeant, mm-hmm. he's, uh, I don't know, the hospital administrator or something like that. Yeah. And we see him there when he introduces these two characters together. And he shows up in Hess's dreams a couple of times wearing these masks. And he has absolutely zero relevance to anything. He's the only white guy in the movie. Just there. And yeah. I don't know. It, we see him a lot early on. He doesn't really do anything. And then he just sort of vanishes. Yeah, we don't He's see like him the again. the character that wasn't. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, 
oh yeah, they're they're drinking and eating and just hanging out. And later, Maida is up in a tree, drunk and sort of suicidal. And Green doesn't want to deal with the police, so he talks Maida down. He's like, I'm the only black man for 30 miles. Don't <laughs> die in my tree. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> later that night, Maida goes berserk and stabs Green with an old bone dagger. And apparently this was the cursed dagger This was dagger the cursed here. dagger, yeah. yeah. Okay. But that's what I was, that's what confused me because I thought, okay, he's already a vampire. We were told he's he was a stabbed. vampire. Stabbing's not going to kill a vampire. No, that, this was apparently. This is the origin it, but it's story. A, yeah, it's a little weird. We, we saw it in text. We had it yeah. described to us. And now we're seeing it. We got this story, story three times now. At least we think so. Yeah. Well, then Maida writes a letter with some pretentious sounding stuff in it. He takes a bath, points a revolver at himself, and pulls the trigger. Elsewhere, Hash Green wakes up unharmed, finds Maida's body, and starts licking up the blood. Mm -hmm. Waste not, want not. Later, we see Green stealing blood from the blood bank. He's a vampire day, now. But, it, but not daylight. Daylight doesn't affect him because this is broad daylight. Yeah. 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 So anyway, he's taking the, the bags of blood from a blood bank. And then there's a garden party, and Green's nephew Enrico comes for a visit. And they have this long conversation about gifts and toys, and it's never met. He's we never see this kid again. Yeah, and that didn't really seem to have a lot of relevance. Yeah, had for no the run. No, it didn't. Story. I mean, you know, I guess in the big. I mean, he's picture, got a family and he's got a social life. I guess that that's what this that was, was showing. Much you know, it. that he's a guy that you know is loved and likes people and people like him, and you know, yeah. Well, Green goes to a bar, and a hooker comes over to earn some easy money. They go to her place, and her pimp comes out of nowhere to fight with Green. Green well, leaves well fed. And before long, Maida's wife Ganja calls, looking for him. She's not happy. She says that George must have gone crazy again. Her hotel is camp ca canceled after her trip to Amsterdam, so she asks to come and stay with him until George turns up. She's cranky and kind of ill-mannered. Invites herself over. Yeah, pretty much insists that you know she's going to come over and stay. Well, before long, they're having sex. Escalated quickly. <laughs> they did. They get along really well. He starts feeling hungry and runs away to hide in the attic with a glass of blood. She eventually finds him there, joins him for more sexy time. And the next morning, she's got all kinds of demands for Archie the butler. And she's already bringing up the topic of marriage. Right now, she's, she's still married to poor old George. For missing George, yeah. <laughs> uh, later that day, Green goes into the city and has a bite. <laughs> Meanwhile, Ganja needs some wine and goes into the wine cellar to find some. She also finds her dead husband in the freezer. Oh, that's what happened to him. Yeah. When he gets home, she reveals, you know, I just couldn't fix dinner. I know you killed my husband. Oops. Just like that. <laughs> yeah. A bit later, she tells a childhood story about a snowball fight. Not long after, the two get married. So I don't think she's too broke up about losing George. No. Yeah. George is weird. Yeah. He mentions that he wants her to live forever. You're into horror movies. I can dig it, she replies. Totally not getting what he's talking about. And they talk in bed, and then they do some things, and the next thing you know, she's dead and bloody. Except she doesn't stay dead. Next morning, she wakes up, not sure what happened. I dreamed you murdered me. He gives her a glass of blood, and then she gets it. The pair invite Richard, a guy from the community center, to come over for dinner. She has sex with Richard, and then she scratches his back and licks the blood off. He doesn't survive the night. They dump his body in a field. She doesn't really take it very well. She doesn't like the idea of killing. She didn't mean to kill him. It yeah, just sort she of, oops. Got the blood lust and, yeah, got carried away. And they read in a book that the cross can kill them, but want to learn more. Well, Reverend Williams is still running his church service, so he talks about not letting evil in the front doors of the place. He asks if anyone wants to be prayed for, and Hess Green walks up to the altar. He must have walked through the front door of the place. Yeah. Well, he's not really evil. He's like like the intro said, he's an addict. I don't know. It was yeah. Well they pray for him and sing, and he smiles and walks out again. He goes home and has Ganja move a light bulb to put him in the shadow of the cross. He wants Ganja to come with him, and he falls down dead. Well, Ganja looks at the cross and considers what she wants to do. Instead of dying, she calls an ambulance for Hess. And, you know, like you know, he looks he just, dead. He just he looks yeah. dead, he just killed over, I got no idea. And then she looks out the window after they leave and sees Richard jumping, ju jumping over Archie's dead body. 
weird. Yeah, weird ending. But I think the implication was that she's the new she's gonna vampire. Stay. She's, she's going to stick around a while. She kind of likes it, yeah. Yeah. Hess didn't like being a vampire. She don't mind so much. Yeah. And now she got a boy toy coming toward her, too. It's a strange <laughs> film. We're told in the opening text that Hess Green was stabbed in with a dagger and became a vampire. We then spend the next 25 minutes watching that happen. Why tell us that it happened and then show it happening? We'd yep. assumed he was Weird. already a vampire at the start of the film. And this part is really kind of boring, as George Maida babbles and mumbles about nonsense for far too long. He's really weird. Yeah, kind of weird and messed up. Not in a good way weird. Yeah. Well, it picks up a bit in the second part, after Hess Green becomes a vampire, and the Gunja versus Archie rivalry bits are kind of funny. Hess and Gunja only kill a couple of people before he figures out how to end his problem, so he's not really what you'd call an evil vampire, just cursed. This thing happens to him, he kills a person or two, sort of by accident, and then he kills himself. He's not bad. She is. She is. Yeah, she's embraced it. <laughs> well, the highly modulated African chanting gets really annoying after a while. I, we yeah, saw this like repetition. three weeks ago, and I can almost still hear it. Yeah, it was in the background a lot. A lot. It was really pretty racy and sexy for the early 70s, but I, today I kind of thought it was kind of tedious and boring. It could have done with a lot of editing. This is a highly regarded vampire film, and I'll admit it's it's unusual and got a unique style to it, but it is so dated and so slow, it's hard to sit through. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. Yeah. But then we watch a short film. Brackish, 2022. Written and directed by Krista Borini. Stars Laura Palacio, Lauren Crandall, and Michelle Hardy. Eight minutes, 19 seconds. Link in the show notes to give it a watch. It's a shorter one. What happens? We see a woman underwater, and she has very strange eyes. She watches a couple of old people in a canoe paddling by and ignores them. Another woman stands on the dock and does a nature landscape painting as the water creature watches. The painter decides to take a break and have a swim. Oh, that's not going to end well, is it? What could go wrong? Well, we find out. And there's no dialogue at all in this one. And the acting is really good. The water creature she's just strange enough to be alien and strange acting without being really monstrous at least at first and the story goes about how you'd expect but it looks good tells a good a good story and um the only complaint would be that the painter and the woman fishing they look an awful lot alike and they're hard to tell apart yeah the two characters toward the end i'm like is that the same woman um that, oh oh no it's not that caused a moment of confusion yeah don't, act, don't cast actors that look so similar. Of course, a lot of these people making shorts don't have a huge selection. Yeah, yeah, might not have had a choice. All right, and that takes us to Bloody Hell from 2020. This is, just came out on Shudder recently. Mm-hmm. It, it was one of those, you know, COVID mess kinds of things where they made it and are just now really releasing it. Yeah. Strongly releasing it. Directed by Alistair Grierson, written by Robert Benjamin, stars Ben O'Toole, Meg Fraser, Carolyn Crane, one hour, 33 minutes. If you haven't heard of this one, there's a trailer in the show notes to get you a little preview. Spoiler free, what happens? Well, it's a romp of an adventure with Ben O'Toole doing an amazing job of playing his character twice over. We get to see the predicament he's in today, interspaced with flashes back showing what led him to be there and it's full of dark humor and gore this is really a good one okay i'm not going to spoil this one entirely because it's fairly new and you probably have not seen it yeah go easy on it so if you want to pause here go watch it we both like this one right we did we did okay this was my favorite of the week what was the fourth one uh the uh moloch moloch yeah which i also liked liked a lot i like this one better but moloch was good too yeah yes all right so again i'm not going to read this whole thing if you do want to read the whole spoiler it's over at horrorguys.com just go there and search for bloody hell or even better yet just see it because you really should see this one because it's really good yeah we thought it was good in helsinki finland alia runs through the woods with people in pursuit when is she going to learn she can't escape family She then chooses to jump in the lake to drown, rather than be retaken by these people, but they pull her out too soon. Somewhere else, in Boise, Idaho, Rex goes to the bank at the wrong time. The place is being robbed by men in masks. Credits roll. We then resume in a courtroom, as Rex is on trial for what he did during the robbery. We don't get to see much of this, but he shot all the robbers like an action hero in the movie. We're told that one innocent hostage was killed, 
and he gets the blame along with eight years in prison. Boom. Eight years later, he sees his own face on the cover of True Crime magazine. He then buys the magazine, and the clerk recognizes him. He's sort of a celebrity now. Photographers start following him around, and some people think he's a hero. Some people think he's a psycho twat, and he gets called a psycho twat quite often. And here already we see his alter ego. It's kind of like a you know a sounding board. We get to see him think to twice. himself. Yeah, yes. think think to himself and talk to himself. And to us, it looks like he's having a conversation with his twin, but really, it's just his own imagination. Uh huh. Yeah, I thought that was really well done. He's not crazy though. It's not that kind of imagination. No, no, it's just us seeing him think. Mm -hmm. He spends a lot of time alone in this movie, so this is one way to get that exposition out of the way. Yeah. Well, he decides sort of, sort of, sort of randomly to go to Finland to avoid the paparazzi. A whole new adventure in a foreign land with no baggage. No one will know who I am. We cut to a man running through the woods in Finland. Something big gets him. Uh Uh-oh. At the airport, a creepy man tells Rex not to go to Helsinki, and the couple behind them were talking about getting Rex. But what does that mean? There's a taxi waiting for Rex when he lands in Finland. The taxi is set up to gas him in the back seat, and he soon passes out. And he wakes up in a bad place, and that's where I'm going to stop reading. Because mm-hmm. then... we're like 15 minutes in. This is all pretty early stuff. Yep. And we see Alia again. We do. The girl who jumped off the pier. Okay, commentary on this one. Rex lives in his own mind so much that he has long conversations and arguments with himself, but at least we get to see the other him while he does it. The imaginary Rex says everything the real one wishes he would have said, which is a lot of fun. The two Rexes talk out their difficulties, which gives a very different spin to a kind of tired horror plot. You've seen this movie before, just without the humor. Mm-hmm. This is well well done. Really well done. At its heart, it's a kidnapping, cannibalistic, torture porn film. But it's funny, so there's that. Actually, we like this one a lot, and we both think this is the best of the week. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then... Moloch. The second of the week. Also so new that we don't want to spoil it very much. This was directed by Nico Vanderbrink. Uh, written by him also, and Dean Butler. Uh, Baker, excuse me, Dean Baker, stars Sally Harmson, Anik Block, and Marcosa Hammer. That's the looks pronunci- like a very international pronunciation, film. and I'm going with it. Yes, these are international names for sure. <laughs> yeah, and this one, uh, both of these last two films, Bloody Hell and Moloch, are both on Shutter this now. Mm-hmm. So those are easy to get. Yeah. Spoiler free. They find well-preserved bodies in the bog. They do that all the time in real life, don't they? Mm, well, they used to. Well, yeah. Long it, it's, time well, ago. It's happened. Okay. Oh, long time. Oh, oh, you mean for real? For real. For yeah, real, real. For real. Yes. Oh, yeah. The and the the bog, has, you know, they they find super well preserved bodies in the bog like that. Yeah. The acids and the tannins and stuff. It's like a natural leathering process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that part's true, trueish at least. Yes. Okay. So they find these bodies in the bog that appear to have been sacrificed with their necks cut in a specific way. But that's just ancient history, right? Eh, Not exactly. Oh, they don't do that anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Well, this one is good, creepy, and builds nicely as we try to figure out what's really going on here. Uh Uh-huh. Spoil it for... Well, read us some of it. I'll read some, yeah. In 1991, we start in a house next to a huge peat bog. There is a little girl sitting in a closet trying to catch a mouse. Except there's screaming coming from the floor above, and the little girl doesn't want to hear that. And then blood drips through the ceiling, and she hides. Well, 30 years later, we see Beatrix all grown up with a daughter of her own. Credits roll. Beatrix and her daughter live with her mother and grandfather. Grandfather Roll says they found something weird out in the bog. And that night, out on the moors, the uh, the bag man, he's kind of a local The local eccentric. homeless guy. Yeah. Well, I don't know if he's even homeless. I, no, I don't think he is. He lives with his father. Yeah, he's, he's just, just kind of crazy. Very weird, crazy. Weird, the weird dude. Yeah. Village idiot. Well, and, he, and the reason they call him the bad bag, bag man is because he literally has dozens of bags all over him, you know, full of, you know, whatever he finds. And yeah, he, he's, he's pretty whacked. But he's digging a hole. He suddenly stops, sees something, and they find his corpse the next morning. What? Well, some American experts come to study the thing they found, and they ask about the police investigating the dead man in the next field. 
Say They say he just died of hypothermia last night. That's our story. We're sticking with it. Yep. The Americans check out what looks like a really old dead body in the bog. <clears throat> well, Beatrix wakes up, and she hears her mother having a seizure. As, as she puts her daughter back to bed, she sees someone standing outside. And Granddad blames the American party, but Jonas, the leader of the Americans, doesn't know anything about that. The doctor suggests that mother's seizures may be caused by something not physical, maybe some old trauma. And Granddad shows his great-daughter, great-granddaughter Hannah the wildlife camera he's installed out on the property. We're not going to see those cameras again, are we? Oh, no, no. <laughs> well, Beatrix has uh, drinks with Jonas, the head American, later that evening. And she tells there's kind of a family curse that keeps the locals a little bit af- afraid of her family. They're kind of leery of them. And that night, Granddad decides to sit outside and watch for possible trespassers. He's, he's paranoid about the American folks. Well, <laughs> Beatrix finds a strange man in the kitchen. I'm sorry, they're making me do it. And he lets out a scream and also almost kills her mother. When Granddad comes in and whacks the man with a hammer. And everyone is pretty traumatized after that. And things just get worse from there. They do. They do. Oh boy, do they. Yeah, <laughs> but it is really good, and it, I thought it really unfolds nicely. Yeah, the uh, Bloody Hell was basically a comedy. This one is this much is more of a comedy. mystery kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not funny. <laughs> this one is just foreign enough to be really interesting. It's a kind of like a local legend that we don't know about, and the whole story is the mystery behind it being exposed. The characters are all interesting and realistic, the situation is tense, and there's lots of suspense all around. The setting... The Foggy Swamp in the Netherlands is really cool. Mm -hmm. Whatever happens in this film has gone on for centuries, and the family kind of knows about it, we find out later. So why didn't they move somewhere else in all that time? I think they were under the power of Moloch, the demon. Well, the ending kind of explains it, but not satisfactorily to me. I I thought it did. Okay. Yeah, I thought it explained it well. Well, well enough. They explain early on, well, you know the name of the movie is Moloch, and yeah. they explain later, early on that Moloch is a demon, but you really don't get a whole lot of monster here, just some glimpses in one scene. It's not about the monster. Other than that, it's a grim, foreboding kind of film with lots of baked-in dread and angst. I really liked it. So do I. All right. So we got two winners and one meh and one loser this week. Yeah. 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 <laughs> You don't get much worse than Halloween 2. <laughs> yeah. There have been worse ones we've seen, but... It's, it's no, yeah, it's, it's yeah. far from the worst we've seen, but it's... We didn't love it. No. No. I regret all of it. <laughs> all right, well, that's our show for this week. Turn in, tune in next week for four more movies and a short. Stop on over at horrorguys.com and read the full spoilers on the ones that we didn't read you the whole thing here. Uh, all are back... This is episode 181. Dang. All... All of the past episodes are available. Go to horrorguys.com and click on the podcast link. You can listen to episode one if you wanted to. Way back in 2018. Wow. Does it seem like four years to you? No. no it it's getting pretty close. Uh, of course, we are up to episode or issue 11 of Horror Guys Month. Horror Bulletin Monthly. Mm-hmm. Too many names here. Horror Guys, Horror Bulletin. All over the place. <laughs> well, anyway, go wait. Well, that sounds like something to explore. Go to horrorguys.com. Then go to horrorbulletin.com. <laughs> Sign up for everything. Sign them all. And yeah. buy our books. That's right. That's the fun part. Yeah. Well, I'm Brian. And I'm Kevin. And we'll see you next week. See ya. See ya.